brand new year, 2023. Welcome to our Karen YouTube audience, and again, good morning to those of you who are with us, and anybody watching on live stream. I am. Um, I have been to the mat with the message this week, um, so you're getting uh, iteration number six or something. Um, and uh, there's a series of chapel topics that move. Uh, out of sync of the year. I think there's 19 of them, so they don't line up against 52 in any predictable way. But in a curious um, synchronicity, today on New Year's Day, the theme is change. And um, I, I like that theme. Change is a good theme, obviously, at some level for people in rehab. And um, for people around the work of a rehabilitation um, project in any sort of way, um, rehabilitation and change are so obviously correlated. And as I started to think about this iterations, first of them, I, I tried to really mash the thought of New Year's resolutions and behavioral change it was going to be where I was going to sort of stay for the part of the message today, and I'm going to start there but not finish. Because there is an entire discipline of behavioral study, and it um, it expresses itself in organizational development, which I learned about in my MBA, and it expresses itself in mental health care, which I learned about um, in being here, and it expresses itself in you know, our day-to-day -day life. And one of the ways it comes up in day-to-day -day life is this weird, interesting thing of the New Year's resolution. And I'm sure, I suspect many of you uh, are aware, it's on um, many broadcast um, platforms in the last week that um, New Year's resolutions are notoriously ineffective. And um, uh, something like uh, less than 10% of people surveyed a year later um, are continuing to enact a New Year's resolution. In fact, a significant number of people cannot remember what the New Year's resolution was from the New Year's Day uh, um, Eve before. And there's theories about why. And, um, uh, uh, when you interview people who are uh, asked why, uh, a couple of big reasons why is that the objectives that they set are too vague, that they don't set up a sort of accountability so they forget or don't uh, track milestones, and, uh, or that they're overly ambitious and kind of too many. And, um, uh, so uh, if you're looking for a good way to sort of change your behavioral health strategies, you could go down that rabbit hole and um, think through the concerns that people have and come up with practical solutions for behavioral change. But the, the thing that we are here about, in my mind, is ill-conceived as behavioral change. I'm sure much of the staff would think, what is Reverend Jack saying? But let me explain why. The concern I have is that narrowing the focus of why people end up in relationship with Karen to behavioral change is undershooting the mark bringing a negative disposition towards it, and fraught with the peril that New Year's resolutions have. And I think we can do better. And I'm gonna jump here. So in the 19th century, people who suffered from what today we call a substance use disorder were very, rarely um, successful in finding freedom from the misery of active addiction. It's only in the 20th century, and it's not because this was a 19th century problem. People have been struggling with this. You find citations in scripture uh, that seem to like indicate that thousands of years ago, and you and I know, thousands of years ago, people were you know, alcoholic, and uh, they didn't have the term necessarily, but this is not a new problem, it, it, and it's a mammalian issue. I remember visiting my sister's pig farm and seeing pigs drinking from one part of the trough, and my sister was like, that's because it's fermented over there. And, um, and you know, birds go for fermented berries, and there's something about this um, nog that, uh, that 
you know, it's, 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 a, it's a medicinal effect and it can have this problem of creating these inescapable trapped behavior that we see is so obviously as addiction. And science is running behind what we all know. It's just like we know when we spot it, but science has worked very hard in the last 100 years to sort of pin down what the definitions are and the characteristics and the brain disorder and all that stuff. So in the early part of the 20th century, a, a solution emerges on human history stage, which has changed our time. It, in 1935, two gentlemen, uh, you know, find each other in their company and they are inspired, I think that's a fair word, to initiate a project. And as they start to initiate the project, it helps them stay sober and they find an exuberance is like, hey, this is working. And, um, and they, it's contagious. They start um, passing it along and it's, it becomes part of the mechanism is the sharing of the solution that empowers the continued recovery. And eventually in 1939, they write a document because they have a hundred or more people who are developing this method. And here we are today, um, not quite a hundred years later. And you know, you're in an institution that has a proud history of standing on the shoulders of these two men and their legacy followers to incorporate 12 steps as part of the heritage and history and to a certain extent very much what we do here. It's not the only solution that we have in our quiver today, but it's a key piece of the puzzle. And in coming to understand what that was, why was this particular thing successful for this particular category of problems when other particular approaches weren't? I'm gonna tell you that I think this distinction between behavioral health and something else is, at, is, is illuminating. So when people read the initial 1939 document and the 12 steps were there and there was the story of the first guy's transformation in the initial chapter, Bill's story, and, and uh, he has this extraordinary experience. It's, it's uh, referred to by many people as a white light experience. And as you read on the chapters, going, they, they keep talking about spiritual experience and spiritual awakening. And this is the direction I'm headed in, is that this is an alternative to thinking about this in the, as merely behavioral change is that whatever that term means, spiritual experience or spiritual awakening, is what makes this essentially different from the New Year's resolution. And there was difficulty among the early adopters of this method with that terminology. People were like, what exactly does this mean? And do I have to have exactly what happened to the guy in the first chapter? So in the second or third edition, I'm not sure which of the, I think it's the second edition of the publication of the primary text, which is called the book Alcoholics Anonymous. There's an appendix. It's the second appendix, and it's only a couple pages long, but it's become one of the most often cited pieces of the literature, which tells you that it's central. And in this appendix, there are various little snippets that are among the most cited aspects, but the one I want to call to our attention today is a small expression that says, we want to clarify what we mean by spiritual awakening or spiritual experience. And they use this phrase, a personality change sufficient to enable recovery from alcoholism or to effect power, uh, recovery from alcoholism. I don't, I don't have the exact quote in my head. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, so it, the, the point I'm trying to make is that initially calling attention to the spiritual experience gave people the notion that there was a magic wand or a incantation or a, uh, you know, uh, I, I remember I used to, I'm old, uh, the Blues Brothers, I don't know if you ever saw the movie, but there's this great scene with John Belushi and his, as a Dan Aykroyd, get, get like zapped at the back of a church and they do cartwheels down the center aisle and it's, an extraordinary and hilarious thing. And people could get the idea from the initial edition of the literature that that's what we think is happening. But in clarifying that one could appreciate a personality change as a spiritual awakening, 
That changes the mark. It changes, I don't think many of us would necessarily obviously make that correlation. And I don't want to get lost in the A or in the literature because I could. I could I could just continue on and on about this point. But I think this is really helpful in illuminating and understanding what the project of faith in human life is. It's about personal improvement. It's about greater quality of life. It's about more effective relationships. It's about love. And it's about, it's about two roads. A road of despair and harm and alienation and, you know, vomiting before you even get to midnight on New Year's Eve and Narcan in front of people that will never forget watching their loved ones near in fact, dead, but being brought back to life. Uh, suicidality, and that's, this is the one road that is, sadly, the very probable next stopping point for people who come into relationship with Cameron. That's why this is here, is because that's the fear of the outcome. And I get really animated sometimes about, this is not about the soup in the cafeteria. And if you're asking where the swimming pool is, there's no swimming pool. <laughs> it's about saving your life. And it's about improving your life. And it's about becoming a person who you can be proud of again. And, and, and living with personal dignity and having meaningful and effective relationships. And if that sounds like a high bar promise, it, all the guidance about New Year's resolutions go against what I'm saying. Because it's a high achievable goal and it's sort of vague and everything. But I'm telling you, that's what is the topic of the day. That's the outcome that we see happen here on a very routine basis. And it is well nigh miraculous. It is extraordinary. It is like, wah! And kind of mind-blowing. It's one of the things I just love. I was speaking with one of our chaplains here, Caroline. She's finishing an internship here. I'm going to miss her. But, and, and God bless her. Please pray for her, because one of the things she's discerned, I'm going to out you here, is that she feels called to congregational ministry. Pray for anyone in congregational ministry. It's a tough gig. And one of the reasons why it's a tough gig is because in that role, I served in that role for 15 years, it's, it's untypical to see the loop-de-loop -loop down the center aisle, wow, transformation. It's one out of maybe 50 or 100 of your congregation that all of a sudden you see like awakened to this dynamic of personal change. But here the ratio is the opposite. Here, most of our patients, they may come in grumbly as heck. They may come in and like, I don't need to be here. But, but recently in measuring outcomes in a wiser way than just do they stay permanently sober forever, we are able to say that something like 85 to 90% of the patients who come here at one year and three month markers are, are not using, which is incredible. And a complete like, rethink of what, when I was first getting sober, people were like, oh, it's really rare and people don't get sober, which is a terrible way of framing this. This is a real opportunity. And that road, which is so dark, I'm not pointing at you guys, but. It's just its general dismal direction is not the necessary outcome. And one of the keys I personally believe to the recent shift in success is recognizing, like the piece of music we just had and the technical foibles had, that imperfection may be part of the journey. That there are people here who are in their third, fourth, or fifth attempt at treatment. And years ago, those folks struggled with a tremendous amount of shame and felt like they were failures. But I keep trying to say to everyone here who is here for a second or third go around of treatment, you should be applauded. 
And you learn, the, the, the smoking cessation people have known this for a long time, that your odds of stopping smoking are better if you've tried to stop smoking before. It's interesting, right? It's kind of a rethink. For the old 12 steppers in the room, you're like, Ooh, we should recognize that sometimes people have to learn to stay sober. And the last thing we need to do is slap people on the butt when they're struggling. <clears throat> and one of the things that can be extremely helpful in this is recognizing that the notion of like shooting it as behavior, I will never drink again, is missing the why. The why is I will have better love in my life. The people who care about me are going to see me with a new set of eyes. I can live into hopes and dreams that this dark path was preventing me from having. I can, I can be a new me, a personality change sufficient for recovery from alcoholism. I can be a new me. Not just a new year, not just a new day, but a new me. I remember I was pessimistic about this in my early life. I used to think, oh, the leopard doesn't change his spots. I hate that saying. Because it's not true of people. People do evolve, transform. This is why we have stories like Scrooge and the Grinch. And, and actually, if you look at classic literature, one of my favorite pieces of theater, King Lear, and almost any character novel and any TV show that you're going to look at at Netflix or whatever, I mean, sadly, the modern media paint a pretty dismal picture of human life and try to get us to love fairly unlovable people. But, but still, in essence, the essence of most plot narratives are transformation of the person. We wouldn't be telling stories over and over in every age and every time about people changing if people didn't change. We would just say, yeah, pack up your toys and go home. He's an alcoholic, forget about it. <sighs> Thank God this is not a truth. <sighs> Thank God there is hope and reason to believe. If you are here with a loved one wearing, I say, the wristband, if they're, you're, you're loving somebody, or if you're a patient here with the wristband, do not let anybody tell you this can't happen. I have seen people come here for the 11th treatment and stay sober. I know people in my home group who went to 14 treatments, and I know a guy, I knew a guy, he's passed away now, but he, when I first met him, he had 17 years of sobriety. It took him 11 years and 17 treatments to get a year of sobriety. learn a lot. Hard way to get there. But it's not that behavioral change is unimportant. Of course it's important. What I learned in AA was it's the littlest, biggest thing. I love these AA expressions. It's the littlest, biggest thing. Because if I'm drinking, I have no hope of the dreams I've just said in front of you. And if I'm drinking, I haven't changed. And there's all kinds of beautiful wisdom in this 1935 jalopy of behavioral change that it turns out behavioral medicine is now catching up and saying, hey, it actually works. Like, one day at a time, and get help, and, um, and, and track your behavior. Remember those things that I said about New Year's resolutions, why they don't work? Actually, AA has fixes for all those things, as does smart recovery, as does recovery dharma. Um, Going it alone doesn't work, but also framing it as mere behavior change is likely to be something that you feel negative about and bring your own pessimism to and, uh, you know, like, oh, I messed up today, so I guess I'm never going to make it, that kind of thing. Whereas an eye on the prize of love and of, and a, and a, and a and, and, a, and a capturing of the spirit that I'm telling you about, that you can be from this day forward different than people have predicted you will always be in the rearview mirror of your life. 
That is absolutely possible. You see a man here who there were people 30 some years ago who were like, Jack, clergy? You gotta be kidding me. Because I didn't exhibit any of this. I was not this motivational, you know, passionate, spiritual dude. I was lost in that dark spiral. And I have watched people cartwheel down this aisle week after week and collect their coins year after year. And you can too. New day, new year, new you. It, it requires boundaries. Relationships require boundaries. And this is a relationship issue. It's a relationship with a substance or a behavior that's causing problems. You need to break up with that. And start working on healthier relationships with yourself. And if you, if you can, this way. And with the other other. I'm so excited about this new year because I get to work in a place where the miracle happens all the time. Welcome aboard.